Great. Thank you, Shannon. Good evening, everybody. I'm David Bachman. I'm a recovery, recovery ambassador, council member for Eating Recovery Center, and I'm also a parent of a son with anorexia. Um, together with Liza, we will be presenting this evening. I just want to spend a few minutes talking about this webinar. Um, this webinar is one of three in ERC's e-learning webinar series. Um, this series was developed to address the needs of parents and families at different stages of their journey with their loved one's eating disorder. Um, tonight, we'll speak to multiple areas, primarily with a focus on signs and symptoms of an emerging eating disorder. Um, the second webinar is on April 18th. Um, that will be more of a concentration on accepting your child and loved one's eating disorder and decision-making for treatment. The third one is on May 4th, and that will dis we, in that one, excuse me, we'll discuss returning home after treatment, recovery protection, and signs of relapse. As Shannon mentioned, registration for the remaining webinars is on ERC's website. Um, let's begin. Liza, I'll hand it over to you. All right. Well, thank you, and I'm glad to be here as well. We are going to start at the beginning, kind of the early stages of detection and diagnosis and move through um, from there. So I have the pleasure of telling you about some of the um, kind of basics, the nitty gritties of the eating disorder definitions that we're talking about. And so uh, we are going to start by looking at anorexia nervosa and do some ex explaining and DSM characteristics of these disorders. So starting with anorexia, um, Anorexia nervosa is a restricted food intake which results in a body weight that's significantly below what would be expected for height, age, sex, um, overall health. And with that is an intense fear of weight gain, an undue emphasis put on body weight and shape in determining one's self-esteem, one's self-worth, and, and or a lack of recognition of the overall seriousness of somebody's low body weight. And so um, primarily this is restricting, but there are, there's a subtype, uh, there are two subtypes. Do you qualify it either as restricting type or binge purge type because there can be binging and purging behaviors as part of the anorexia. So moving on to bulimia nervosa, we are talking about frequent episodes of consumption of a very large amount of food and then feeling out of control while doing so and then engaging in what we call compensatory behaviors to prevent weight gain. So this is self-induced vomiting, use of laxatives, diuretics, fasting, excessive exercise, and in, um, for individuals with type 1 diabetes, it could be the misuse of insulin in order to prevent calorie absorption. And again, self-esteem is very dependent on body image. And this disorder has a qualifier of frequency and duration of at least once a week for a duration of three months. So binge eating disorder is um, characterized also by binging episodes, which is defined as eating within a two-hour time period an amount of food that would be definitely larger than what most people would eat given similar circumstances. Um, this is, there's often a feeling of being out of control that's evidenced by eating until you're uncomfortably full, eating when you're not hungry, eating alone because you're embarrassed or ashamed of the behavior. And then there's kind of this um, emotional aftermath of feeling disgusted, depressed, very guilty, um, and that causes distress and impairment in one's life. And again, this also has a frequency qualifier of uh, once a week for at least at least once a week for a duration of three months. On our next slide, uh, what we call OSFED is other specified feeding or eating disorder, um, and this is basically an eating disorder that doesn't meet full criteria for one of the other diagnoses, but has behaviors that are causing significant distress or impairment. So, an ex examples would be atypical anorexia, which would be somebody maybe who has um, engaged in all of the behaviors that accompany anorexia. They have the body, body image disturbance. Um, they have the overall preoccupation with body being the, the identifier of worth. 
um, but they might not be at an abnormally low body weight. And this can happen if somebody maybe started out at, at, as technically overweight and then their restricting behaviors brought them to a normal weight. That would be an example of when that could happen. Uh, other examples it might be bulimia or binge eating disorder but with less frequency in terms of symptoms. Uh, purging disorder which would just be purging without binge eating and then night eating syndrome which is um, excessive nighttime food consumption. Uh, next, we're going to talk about ex avoidant restrictive food intake disorder. This is ARFID. Uh, this is newer to the DSM and as of 2013. It was previously called selective eating disorder. And we are um, learning more and more about it all the time. So this is, uh, and you'll hear some similarities to anorexia. So there's inadequate food intake, but the reason is different. So in anorexia, um, there's a strong drive from this body image angle. But in ARFID, there's a lack of interest in food, just a lack of appetite, lack of desire for food. Or there could be sensory concerns about food, like the texture, the taste, the color. Um, it could be any kind of discoloration on a particular food item makes it a rule out. That's not something somebody's going to eat. Um, or it could be aversive consequences of eating, so vomiting, choking, um, or an allergic reaction is going to make me sick. Uh, those are, that's what drives the lack of adequate intake. With that comes nutritional de deficiencies. Um, people with ARFID can be dependent on nutritional supplements or even tube feedings. Um, but they also have the weight that's too low or insufficient based on growth. Uh, so, Similar to anorexia, but different, different drive. All right, so um, some numbers. I wanted to go through some of these numbers and some of the myths. There are a lot of myths that are connected to eating disorders, um, really misconceptions that fuel some of the problems of people not seeking treatment, um, some of the stigma related to eating disorders. And so first one I want to mention is that uh, the myth being this is a girl's issue. And really what we know is that of the 30 million people in the U.S. that will suffer from an eating disorder, 10 million of those are males. And that is a, a significant chunk of the percentage. So that leads to another misconception is that all males with eating disorders are gay. And while they're, gay men are seven times more likely to report binging and 12 times more likely to report purging than straight men, um, there is some, the, the evidence is a little suspect in terms of actual numbers because of the stigma. Are men really reporting? And it's certainly not exclusive to gay men. Another thing that um, I've heard parents talk about is um, getting feedback from the people in their lives that this is a choice, that somebody is choosing to have an eating disorder. And we know that they're not a choice. They are a serious and complex mental illness. Uh, and 50 to 80 percent of the risk factors for anorexia and bulimia are genetic and heritable. Um, another thing that we see a lot for, from parents is this kind of burden of guilt they're under, that they've done something to cause their child's eating disorders. And unfortunately, this can be reinforced by people around them saying, um, well, what did you do? Or um, I could make them do things differently, which further kind of perpetuates the isolation. But we know that causes of eating disorders are thought to be a combination of genetic, temperament, and environmental factors. Uh, we have a saying that we use a lot related to that, that genetics load the gun and environment pulls the trigger. Um, but we know there's not one cause. It's usually a complex interaction of events and vulnerabilities. Um, sometimes people think, this is just a phase. My child will outgrow it. Um, but eating disorders are the deadliest of all mental illnesses. And death comes from medical complications of the eating disorder or from suicide. And eating disorders in children are on the rise. And I think it's astonishing that in the last decade, there was a 119% increase in the number of children under 12 admitted to hospitals for eating disorders. Uh, another misconception is that this is a lifelong illness. Uh, people don't really get better from it. 
but early detection and treatment are associated with better rates of recovery, and 80% of patients who receive and complete treatment will recover or improve significantly, which is very hopeful. Um, uh, a myth related to um, kind of the, the image of eating disorders is that, um, well, if somebody's not underweight, they can't have an eating disorder. But 35% of binge eating disorder patients and 30% of bulimia patients are considered medically obese. And many are of normal weight. And so using weight exclusively as a determination of whether or not somebody has an eating disorder obviously is not appropriate nor accurate. So those are some of the stats that we have and some of the, the myths. There are many more. And I think, David, you had some that you might have found yourself operating under without even knowing. I, can you talk to us about those? I, I, I do. Thank you. I'm going to just switch the slide real quick. Uh, there we go. Yeah, thanks, Liza. You know, myths surrounding eating disorders are confusing for parents. I found it to be especially confusing for myself and also my wife did as well. When we started to learn about eating disorders when our son was diagnosed at the age of 12 with anorexia, now that he is 16, we continue to live with those myths as they are out there and they, they always seem to surface, you know, with new people that we meet and even continue conversations with folks that we know. Um, when I first started to learn about the myths, I believed the majority of them and was confused by the rest. Over my four-year journey as a parent, I learned the truth about these myths. There are, there are many more than what you see on your screen on this particular slide. However, I just want to take a couple of minutes and speak to a few of them that represented my confusion over eating disorders when I really had little to no knowledge of what an eating disorder even was, let alone make sense of these myths as my son's symptoms of his eating disorder were emerging right in front of, in front of us. Um, let's look at a couple of them. You know, friends and family repeatedly asked us why our son is choosing not to eat. Many said, you know, he must be a, a defiant preteen who wants to cause his parents problems. You know, eating disorders are, are not a choice. You know, how can your son have anorexia? He's not a girl. I was even asked this by his middle school counselor. Um, eating disorders don't discriminate you know, by the sex of a person. Eating disorders are the most serious of all mental illnesses. I was completely dumbfounded when I was asked, what did I do to my son to make him that way? You know, this will pass. It must be a phase some kids go through. I was told by many people, you know, we've learned eating disorders are not a fad. You know, I, I even had somebody go as far as saying, you know, don't worry, boys are like dogs. When he gets hungry enough, he'll eat his supper. You know, no one in our family or social circles understood that eating disorders are a bi biologically based disease. You know, one of the last ones I just wanted to, you know, talk about as on our confusion of myths. You know, I, I had people say to us, hey, what type of parent are you? How could you send someone so young out of state to a treatment center? You know, we learned early intervention and comprehensive treatment for eating disorders drive successful outcomes, and for our son, it saved his life. Thanks, David. So, oh, you're welcome. Are you, are you, were you done? I, yeah, I just uh, okay. advanced your slide. Okay, super. Um, so we want to kind of highlight some of the signs and symptoms and uh, talk about what those look like. The signs and symptoms really take vigilance uh, from those around the individual because um, they are easily explained away if you're not kind of um, maybe suspicious or maybe keeping an eye out for something. So uh, we are going to run through these. So weight loss, I mentioned, not, not a sufficient um, quality by itself, but certainly an indicator, um, particularly in anorexia. Restrictive eating, uh, this can take many forms. So this can take the form of skipping meals. Uh, often I hear that lunch is the first thing that goes. It's getting thrown away at school or it's coming back, um, not eaten. And um, that is an easy cutout for kids. 
It could be the elimination of um, quote unquote junk food, the desire to be healthy, and so there are foods that suddenly are off limits. It might be the elimination of entire food groups, whether dairy or grains or whatever it is. And usually that restrictive eating only becomes more and more narrow throughout the course of the illness. Um, intense fear of being fat or gaining weight, this can sound, to a parent this might sound directly like, um, do you think I've gained weight? Do you think I'm too big? Will this food make me fat? Um, for asking for direct feedback. It could be you see your child looking in the mirror a lot more, maybe lifting up their shirt, maybe checking themselves out from various angles. Um, we see kids a lot that are using their hands to check the size of their thighs or um, kind of comparing with those around them, um, checking sizes of clothes, going to younger siblings' clothes. Uh, those can be indicators of that fear. Unusual habits, we tend to call these food rituals, so eating in very small bites, pacing very slowly, overusing condiments, or eating very bland food, eating in a particular order, not letting your food touch, um, really just pushing your food around the plate, hiding food. Um, I have had many families talk about their dog that was gaining weight because uh, food was going uh, to the dog under the table. Uh, isolation and withdrawal from family and friends or activities, this can be particularly true when the situations involve food as that can create a lot of anxiety that they'd rather avoid. Compulsive exercising or excessive movement or just you start noticing like, um, boy, they're up a lot. They're really taking a lot of trips that seems unnecessary and this is a change. Um, binge eating or evidence of, the evidence might be um, obviously you see somebody binging or you see food is missing suddenly. You've gone to the grocery store and you just can't find several of the things that you bought or you notice that your loved one is um, putting food in pockets or you're finding wrappers under the bed or um, in the laundry. And so uh, purging or evidence of, Similarly, you may know directly or you may see that your loved one is slipping away after every meal. They're in the bathroom. They may be running the water while they're in the bathroom. They're taking showers at times that they never took showers. Uh, there's odor that uh, is suspicious for vomit. Um, I've talked with many kids and many parents who have found containers or kids who are purging in containers in their room. Um, could be complaint or dressing in layers to stay warm, or it could be dressing in layers to avoid being seen. And the dressing in layers to stay warm is you'll you have a thought that um, boy, it's hot out, and they're wearing a long sleeve sweatshirt, and they don't seem to be concerned about that or too warm. Uh, complaints of being cold, GI distress, tiredness, or excessive energy. Um, overusing non-caloric beverages or caffeinated beverages, which can dull the appetite. Excessive use of mints, gums, and mouthwash, mouthwash which may be an effort to uh, avoid eating, or it could be to um, cover up a concern of bad breath from vomiting. Um, frequent checking the mirror, I talked about that. And then some of the physical signs and symptoms, uh, weight changes, those are obviously visible sometimes and sometimes not so much, and um, then dry skin. Swelling along the jawline from overactivation of the salivary glands from purging, dizziness or fainting, uh, calluses or irritation on the knuckles from um, purging teeth or kind of scraping up against the knuckles, lab abnormalities, brittle nails, menstrual irregularities in girls, sleep problems, and dental problems can be some of the physical signs. So David, what might parents go through when they see some of the signs? Tell us about kind of what that was like when some of those symptoms started emerging for you guys. Yeah, exactly. Um, the next couple of slides I'm going to, you know, talk about the signals that we missed as parents, also how we justified um, the behaviors of those signals, and then what were the realities that we we finally were able to, to pull out of everything that we, we missed. You know, I've heard of eating disorders in the past, um, mostly the term anorexia, um, when our son was, was first exhibiting signals. 
beyond that level of awareness, I really didn't have have much more. As our son was changing, that's how I originally described it, both I and my wife missed signals of an eating disorder. You know, we knew something was happening. You know, he was doing things, um, but we recognized him, but we really didn't know how to label it. You know, our, our lives, probably like many American households, were, I love the term, a culture, culture of busyness. You know, we had dual-income household. We had two kids going in every direction. We had our social outlets. We traveled. We had projects going on. All of that was like juggling balls in the air. And then at the age of 12, our son changed schools from elementary to middle school. His moods changed. His social circles changed. Um, As well as they changed, they got smaller and smaller. Um, He started isolating in his room, becoming glued to his smartphone on a very obsessively increasing way. Um, On a spring break um, to Florida, um, he didn't have any interest in going to his favorite restaurants that we always visited when we were in Florida. Um, He wouldn't eat his breakfast, um, you know, touting it as, you know, a lack of hunger. Um, And we started noticing how anxious he was around eating. You know, we started chalking that up to, you know, a, a kid in Florida on spring break out of the, you know, the snowy and cold Midwest weather. Um, You know, we even joked um, amongst ourselves how obsessive and OCD he was for excessively jumping on his his trampoline. Um, When I asked him how he got cuts on his arms, I noticed all of a sudden he had cuts on his arms. He said it was from the waves and the surf. I didn't even stop to think long enough that, you know, on the Florida coast and the Gulf of Mexico, there really is no surf. So as we were seeing those signals and, and, you know, witnessing them, we started to justify them Um, because it seemed so logical at the time when we saw it, when we saw them um, based on what our level of knowledge was, which didn't include that of eating disorders. Um, When we returned from spring break, we focused on healing the cuts on his arms. Um, We didn't want them to become infected from the beach or playing around in the sand. Um, It wasn't until I found him secretly disassembling a shaving razor that I realized why he really had the cuts on his arms. And then this is where we went to focus. Um, Next, when I received our monthly phone bill, I saw that he had a whopping 17,000 texts for the month. I told my wife and said, hey, he must have set some type of record. I didn't even think to check them as he was never a kid who made us suspicious. As I found him at midnight texting and speaking with people who we realized were strangers, our instincts started telling us that something else is going on here. But we still didn't even even think of the fact that this could be related to an eating disorder. Um, He was still throwing his food away at school and complaining how gross the food was in the cafeteria. So we packed lunches, and he stopped complaining. Fast forward, he at least recycled the bag before he tossed the packed lunch. So our parent journey began at that point in time. When we brought our son to a child psychologist for cutting, the psychologist said we had a bigger problem, which is not his specialty. He said our son was restricting eating, and purging everything he ate. He recommended that we seek the help of an eating disorder therapist. My wife and I looked at each other and said, what's that? Is there really someone who specializes in getting someone else to eat? As I am sure you're already sensing as I speak about our journey as parents, we were really nothing more than, you know, a deer in the headlights of our son's eating disorder. As we met with our eating disorder therapists and we started to learn about their specialty, about professional dietitians, about food planning with exchanges in our calories, um, and we were introduced to family-based um, treatment, our eyes were starting to open to, to this world of eating disorders and also to the mountain of information that we as parents need to learn. Um, and we felt that was so critical because how can we help our son 
um, with something that we didn't even know anything about. Um, when I reviews, reviewed excuse me, my son's smartphone, I found connections with strangers who were really you know, pro their life with anorexia. I found apps for counting calories. He was capturing images of other males his age and commenting to strangers on how he wanted his body to look like, like this athlete or some popular sports figure. You know, he was a kid who never needed anything more than Motrin, um, needing meds to help with anxiety over foods and obsessing over what he wouldn't eat, you know, became our reality and it became a necessity for him. You know, friends and families, um, members, excuse me, who, who took the myths that are out there that we spoke about earlier and they tossed them in our face, um, those people became toxic to us. And we, we moved away from them in one form or another. You know, the, the realities of the eating disorder um, really became also apparent, you know, when it, it became really critical that we ensured we were getting the right professional help for our son. Um, that became overwhelming for us in the beginning because it was a world we were just learning about, and we were doing it in a vacuum. As in that point of time, four years ago, we really had no resources of where to go to really know where we need to get the help and get the information. And Liza, I think that's probably a good point to cut over to the next topic. Yeah. Um, kind of what are those first steps and how do you go about getting help? And um, you know, we know that the Internet can be not helpful sometimes for people with eating disorders. There are unfortunately a lot of um, pro eating disorder websites and material out there, but they can be a tremendous resource for a starting point for parents. And we all tend to Google, if we're sick, we tend to go to Google and kind of figure out what's going on. Or um, if we're curious about something, we, we have the Internet. And so um, that being said, there are great resources out there. And I've got several of them up here for you. Uh, they can be a resource for just learning, finding information. They can be a resource for directing family to as well and saying, hey, why don't you learn a little bit about this with us. Um, they can also help steer you in the direction of finding appropriate treatment. And so I would encourage you to check out all of these websites. I will say NIDA in particular has a parent toolkit that's very useful and, and, and really worth um, looking into. So. Um, that's a great place to start, but you need real life people that can help navigate this uh, very confusing situation and um, provide you with some guidance that you need. And so a team usually uh, is required for treating an eating disorder given how complex they are. And so that is typically a medical provider, a therapist, and a dietitian. And we'll get into those a little bit more. And a team is most effective when they are in communication with each other, and when they are aligned with each other. And so you want to maybe interview prospective um, providers and ask them, is there a dietitian that you work with? Is there a physician that you work with? And for, for all of the providers, uh, who would they recommend? Because you want to know that they're going to be on the same page and supporting you in the direction that you need to go. Um, so starting first with a medical provider, people tend to go to their pediatrician first. They're kind of uh, often the first line. And we um, know that they can be very helpful, but we also know that they may not have all the information about eating disorders. And so um, it isn't realistic to think that all pediatricians do, but you can ask. You can, um, you as a consumer want to know what kind of uh, knowledge your pediatrician has about eating disorders. So you can ask them what their experience is, um, what kind of concerns they would have about treating your child, um, do they feel comfortable treating your child, um, what kind of things are they looking for medically. Um, because these are such complex illnesses, a trained medical provider is needed to recognize signs that would tell you uh, if they need a higher level of care, if they're physically not safe enough to be managed at an outpatient level. 
So they also monitor for refeeding syndrome. They watch for heart and electrolyte abnormalities and other lab values and really provide kind of that first line of direction. So some primary care docs are comfortable with medication management. Sometimes medications are prescribed for people with eating disorders. So you want to know, is your, is your provider comfortable with that? Or would a psychiatrist be a better fit? So your team actually might include a medical provider for physical health, but then also a psychiatrist for medication management. Um, there is an AED, the Academy of Eating Disorders, which is on the slide with all the websites on it, has a tool for medical providers. It's a booklet on some of the complications related to eating disorders. And that is something you could even look at and take to your doctor and ask them to help you kind of sort through it and understand it a little bit. Um, the most important thing, I think, is are your concerns being heard? Um, I have heard stories of fantastic pediatricians who really were instrumental in providing the help that was needed. And sadly, I've heard parents talk about their in extreme frustration with having a gut sense and the observation that something isn't right, but feeling like their concerns were dismissed by a medical provider. And so it's important that you feel heard and that you're, you feel like your concerns are being taken seriously. And you may want to ask them, are they willing to see you more often to monitor if there's any change in this? If they're, if they're saying, I, I'm not really sure if this is an eating disorder, are they willing to kind of um, investigate further? Next, uh, we're looking at therapists. So um, some of the designations that are typical you would see, these are people with master's degrees or, or doctorate degrees in a helping profession. So a licensed clinical social worker, licensed professional counselor, and different states um, have a little bit different letters related to these. Um, uh, somebody with a PsyD or a PhD or a licensed marriage and family therapist. So your therapist's role is to provide Psychoeducation, um, they, you're, you're coming in needing a lot of information, and they should be able to um, begin, that with, begin that process with you. Uh, they, you want somebody that's consulting with a team. You want them to help you know if it's time to step up to a higher level of care. You want them to be able to give you pretty clear direction on what your role is as a parent. And then they're obviously also working at some of those things that are underlying the eating disorder, um, healthy coping and emotion management, and um, more effective skills rather than the dangerous behaviors of the eating disorder. So questions you can ask. Uh, this is really just the initial questions. There are, are many questions you can ask outpatient providers, um, outpatient therapists. But first, you want to know what is their experience in treating eating disorders. And so you can ask them if they have training or credentials in the treatment of eating disorders. One website that we didn't mention is the International Association of Eating Disorder Professionals. And IADEP has um, a certified eating disorder specialist designation for outpatient providers, uh, which would tell you that they've gone through the training and the required supervision to have that. You can ask them if they have any professional affiliations with eating disorder organizations. I was actually on an outpatient therapist website today um, that we wanted to see if we could work with. And she um, has all of her professional affiliations listed on her website. And there were at least two eating disorder um, organizations there, which tells us that she's invested time in those as um, that's an spe area of specialty. You can ask somebody what percentage of their practice is clients with eating disorders. There are people that say they treat eating disorders, but they might have uh, really just a few a year that are um, not maybe as severe as some might be. Um, you can ask what role you would have in the treatment process. How will you be involved in sessions? Uh, what therapy modalities do you use? Um, we talk a lot about family-based treatment. Um, there's, there's been uh, an unfortunate stigma in, in the past of really this is something that therapists are going to do to a child to fix them, and parents are removed from the process. But parents really are um, very critical to the treatment process and should be 
uh, included and seen as a member of the treatment team. And so those are some of the things that you want to hear from an outpatient therapist. A uh, registered dietitian, their role is to establish a meal plan to promote weight recovery and normal eating, nutrition education, support with identifying needs for structure related to meals, um, support with identifying, again, when it's time to step up to a higher level of care. So many of the same questions, probably the only one that's really notably different is asking, you can ask about their nutrition philosophy. Um, are, they have a, a mentality of eliminating certain foods because they have a kind of an addiction model. Um, and that would be something that we would probably say would could perpetuate the eating disorder mentality of I must avoid certain foods because they're dangerous. Um, you can also ask if they are familiar with FBT, um, calories versus exchanges. A calorie obsessed kid um, may really struggle with parents trying to work on a meal plan that is calorie based. Um, so, I think, David, you had some input on what you would add to identifying a team and some of the challenges that that can bring. I, I do. Thanks. Yes. Um, getting help for our son and, and identifying who, who, what, and where is the best help for him was um, began as a very daunting task for us because our lack of knowledge and, and our learning curve was was just starting to develop. develop. Um, when I look back at that phase of our parent journey, I see it as you know, barriers we were faced with, missteps um, that occurred. And then third, how do we recalibrate ourselves as parents to get that best help for our son? Um, looking at the barriers, it wasn't really until we, we started to meet with our local eating disorder therapist and we started to learn about our son's diagnosis, you know, what are the different treatment options, and then, of course, you know, we learned about the risk to his health and life. We realized that, hey, this is really going to be a long journey for our son and also for us as parents. We weren't quite sure really what to expect or how long this journey would take, but we realized that we had to promise each other that our, our relationship, that being my wife and I, had to be a priority as well, and that we had to be on the same page regarding decisions for our son, not even really knowing what, you know, those, those care decisions may be, you know, down the road. Um, we felt this was really critical, um, not only for our marriage and our family survival, but for us to learn everything we still didn't know about eating disorders. You know, we, we felt very strongly if we didn't have our mental, physical, health and that deteriorated, you know, how could we then help our son who, where his health was deteriorate, deteriorating as well? You know, also striving for a work and family balance is, is challenging onto itself for anybody. You know, once an eating disorder, you know, becomes part of that equation, you know, life for us seemed to be really beyond, beyond complex. Um, sorting through um, all the different barriers that exist, you know, with different treatment options. What are they? How to understand them? Um, how to differentiate them um, with eating disorders? Well, we really didn't even fully understand the terminology in that world that treatment centers use. Um, and the definitions, you know, of those became, you know, very taxing for us. You know, um, we went, as Liza mentioned, one of our first retreating places as well was um, to our pediatrician um, who just further um, went to the confusion and, and the barrier and challenge of, of trying to get and figure out the right help. While he had very stellar medical training, his medical training really didn't include um, the specialty of eating disorders. You know, keeping our family whole, with our, with our other son being angry at us for spending more time with our son with an eating disorder, not spending, you know, time with equal time um, with his brother. Um, all of a sudden, it, it seemed that all these barriers were causing our, our family to, um, to fall apart. Um, when our eating disorder therapist recommended a higher level of care for our son, 
um, that being residential treatment, we were adamant that we would not send our son away. Plus, we had a planned vacation that literally was about two weeks away um, from that conversation. Um, going against our therapist's recommendation to not travel to Europe and fear a further decline in our son's health just seemed unacceptable to us. Um, you know, we had the trip organized, we had it paid for, and we also felt um, that, you know, our trip to Europe, you, you know, could go very well. I mean, we were, hey, we were using FBT at home. You know, we felt at that point in time, you know, we, we had it down pat. Um, meltdowns over meals were pretty normal, so we can deal with those whether we are home or not. You know, we had, you know, um, a hiking trip planned um, while we were away, and we, we felt, hey, we can just ensure enough snacks, not really knowing anything about how to really plan for increases to exercise. Um, needless to say, the trip was a colossal failure, um, and our son's eating disorder just, just soared. Um, we returned home, and he would not eat anything. His health was declining fast. Um, we accepted we could no longer do this on our own. Our trip proved it, hands down. Um, four years ago, we were aware of three treatment centers who accepted adolescent males. We literally Googled a map, looked at each location, and picked the one closest to St. Louis where we live. Outside of reading the website, um, receiving a recommendation from our therapist and the treatment center's intake process, that was the extent of our due diligence on getting care and getting help for our son. Um, we didn't even know that we should consider post-residential treatment, but we knew of a center in St. Louis that had one. So, hey, we, we were good to go. Once we brought our son home, we quickly realized that he was relapsing, even in a step-down program in St. Louis. As we admitted him for medical stabilization in a local children's hospital, we started to apply what we have learned to this point um, as he obviously would need another higher level of care. We deleted the Google map and we invested our energies into researching other programs for adolescents, in our case, an adolescent male. Um, we intently researched the treatment center's methodologies their programs, their approaches, the composition of their treatment teams, and the professionals in those teams. Um, when we decided on, this, on the treatment center whose treatment model would best meet our son's need, we then went through the intake process. Um, we asked for thorough explanations and clarifications to ensure we, as non-professionals in that field, that we as parents fully understood everything before we, we committed to admitting our son um, for his next, his next stage of treatment. As important, we all also invested time into taking care of our other son, his needs, also our needs as parents and as individuals, and how best to manage our jobs for the time that we would need to support our son in treatment, whether that would require um, you know, us to take leave, um, but it was so important to ensure that we not only recalibrated the care, best care and health for our son, but we also recalibrated the best care and health for us as individuals and also for our, our work. And I, that brings us really to the impact this has on the family. And um, I've I've made it kind of, I've, I've been doing inpatient residential eating disorder treatment for 14 years and I've asked many, many families um, to describe what this experience has been like for them. And there are some very consistent themes that emerge when I ask that question. I'd say um, universally I hear parents describe feeling helpless and powerless. Uh, this disorder that um, it, it just really defies uh, logic and your previously rational or compliant child suddenly is unable to 
um, think logically about this particular issue. And I've talked to many families who have tried everything they know. And as a parent, um, it's your job to help your child when they have a problem. And to not to see yourself not be able to do that is demoralizing and frustrating and exhausting. Um, just very impactful. I also hear a lot of self-blame and guilt from parents uh, wondering what they've done, and this is all this is consistent as well. No matter um, what the experience is, parents often feel like they've done something to cause this, and that can get in the way of them really being able to mobilize a resource for their child. Um, I'm glad you mentioned, David, the impact on siblings. The siblings get really kind of lost in the process. Uh, they sense and are aware that there is something very serious happening with their sick sibling. And they um, may try to steer clear or to try to not be um, a problem. Uh, they may act up to get more attention. Um, but either way, the focus obviously has to be on the kid that is very ill. And so, um, and it's scary for siblings. They don't understand it. Certainly if the parents are having a hard time understanding it, it's really confusing for a child um, to grasp what's going on for their siblings. And this really takes a toll. So all of these feelings, it, it bogs parents down and makes being a resource to their loved one very challenging. And so um, David, I wonder if you can tell us some of the things you've learned about being a resource, some of the what, things you've had to prioritize, how you guys have um, gone about that. Yeah, I, absolutely. Thank you. You know, logical thinking, you know, was so challenged for us as parents. You know, we were exhausted. Um, we had information overload. You know, we were trying to balance and prioritize so many things simultaneously that the the effects in our family in the beginning were were these scary unknowns um, when we began our our journey. You know, um, with our son's eating disorder. Um, you know, out the gate, the very first thing, and I mentioned this earlier, that my wife and I recognized that our marriage really ha had to be first. Um, that was that was so critical. Um, we also, not only as husband and wife, but also with our other son as family, you know, we had to continue communication, and, and communication was certainly challenged um, at all junctures and, and points. It was, it was never perfect, but we we couldn't lose sight of, of the fact that we had to, you know, really get that back back on track. Um, Self-care um, became really critical, um, ensuring that each of us individually, you know, we took care of ourselves. Um, you know, the, the mental care, the physical care is, you know, was, was very, very important um, because the effects, of eating disorders on, on that causing despair, um, causing fear, you know, r really weighed on us um, physically and mentally. And it was just so key for us to recognize that self-care component is critical, you know, for us as, as individuals. Um, you, you know, we also, we, we set a goal. We maybe didn't really achieve it every week, but we really tried to of finding something that we could do that would make us happy um, outside of our son's eating disorder, whether it was seeing a movie, it was going somewhere, it was, you know, accomplishing something. It was still something that, that always kept, you know, a spark of happiness in our lives. So, you know, we, we wouldn't be pulled into the doldrums of, of depression. Um, you know, we retooled our social circles, um, you know, friends that got it, uh, friends that understood what we were going through as parents, friends that could support us um, in a very positive way um, became very important to us. Um, we also relied on uh, individual therapists to help us through our, our own thoughts and concerns and worries, you know, over, over our son. Um, you know, we we really looked as best as we could with our for my wife and I at our jobs. 
you know, of, of creating that balance, you know, with our employment and our and our goals and our careers. And you know, when when can we achieve what we want to in our careers, and when is the right time to do that, um, given what we have to focus on, um, you know, with our son. Um, we got on board with really bringing back into our lives um, family meals and family equations. You know, that culture of bus- busyness I mentioned earlier, that, you know, that really takes out that foundation of having family meals. And we moved away from it, and we, we really moved, moved back to that. You know, importantly, though, you know, when I really look at the effects you know, back in our family and us as parents and our journey, you know, it it seemed to really center on sacrifice. You know, as parents, we, you know, reward and sacrifice for our children. You know, we realized and learned that the concept of that parental sacrifice had to expand to areas of our lives that we never thought of before our son was diagnosed with a zoonotic disorder. And we refer to this as our new normal. And this new normal is how we live our lives. You know, our, our son today is, is still moving forward and trying to find a path for recovery. Um, it has its challenges. It's not perfect. You know, and, and we as parents are, are always looking to find out how, how we can improve, um, how we can improve the support for our son, each other, and our family. You know, we we try not to dwell on the sacrifices we have made to support our son. Um, we try and, and focus on the positive effects that we can lift out of um, these sacrifices and applaud the little and big rewards as he continues to pursue each step and phase for his recovery. Thank you. Um, so, Sh- Shannon, you want to yeah, take this one? Yeah, so we are actually at our um, questions and answers portion. So um, we'll just move on to our slides, and you guys can answer them um, however it works best for you. So I'm just going to click over to those. And I have a lot of questions coming in, so I'm going to try to keep up with them. So here's your first um, question and answer slide. And All right. If you guys wouldn't mind reading the question out loud and then answering it, that would be great. Okay. Um, so on this first one, is there a difference between a dietitian and a nutritionist? Um, there are, uh, there can be. So sometimes people use the term nutritionist to refer to a dietitian. Um, but what we're talking about is a registered dietitian. Um, because really there's, there is not much that regulates somebody calling themselves a nutritionist. And whereas somebody who is a registered dietitian has gone through the process and the education to um, be considered a registered dietitian. So we would say pursue a registered dietitian. Um, David, do you want to take the next one? Sure. The next question is, Eating disorders almost seem quote unquote trendy. How can I get the point across how dangerous they are? Um, you know, trendy, I guess, could fall into the category of those confusing myths. Um, you know, there, there's nothing trendy. It's, it's not a fad. Um, eating disorders are, are not a choice. Um, it's, a, it's a mental illness. Um, that has the highest mortality rate. Um, It's one that is is certainly not a choice. Um, You know, when I see the word trendy associated with eating disorders, um, to me, I take that back to the myth about it being a fad and bringing it home on, you know, the the dangers and health risks um, of having an eating disorder. Um, and, and, and I can. Yeah, and you can add to that. Yeah, no, go ahead. Right. So, the third question you mentioned vacationing. I'm wondering what you think about school. School schedules are so hectic. It seems like it would create a lot of anxiety to quit school and go to treatment. Um, it is 
Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk to this bit, David. I'd love your input too. It, it is a huge sacrifice to uh, leave school and leave life at home to go to treatment for sure, and that can create stress. Um, but really, the way I look at this is uh, eating disorders are so dangerous. And early detection and treatment are so important that the, it, I think it's worth the stress that it would create in the short term uh, for the long-term gain of being able to continue school, not having to miss school at a later time, not missing college, those kinds of things. Ava, what would you add to that? Yeah, I, I, I agree. You, you know, obviously with our son being away at treatment, um, he was absent from his school. Um, when we recalibrated our decision making and, and looked at treatment centers, um, one of the many criteria that we as parents had was how does that treatment center handle the edu education? And that was really critical because, yes, you, you know, missing school will create a huge amount of anxiety, staying back a year and our son's mind would be completely unacceptable. So they're understanding how the treatment center handles the coordination, the schoolwork back with, in our case, with our son's school was, was very important. Um, we found that the treatment center had an investment into licensed teachers um, that did an excellent job of coordinating back with our son's teachers and his counselors to ensure that the need to know information um, was carried through and completed during his, his time in treatment. Um, there was also coordination back on his return home with his teachers. Um, so all the educators were on the same page of what he accomplished and what he didn't. Um, and then we got ahead of the curve on that return for where, where those voids existed to line up tutoring resources that would not add more stress to an elongated school day, but a way to start plugging those, those voids that he needed to matriculate back, back into school. So for us to continue school to the best that he could, because as Liza said, the treatment is a top priority for the eating disorder, but we have been successful and coordinating that continuum of, of school. So there, that anxiety of having to quit or repeat a year, you know, wasn't there. All right. Um, so our next, whoops. <laughs> our next question, as a professional, how can I help my patients and their families accept that a higher level of care is needed? And how do I then help them navigate finding the right treatment setting? Um, I think setting, setting concrete goals and measurable goals in an outpatient setting is really important so that um, you know when you're succeeding and when you're falling short of meeting the goal. Um, I think the education about the, the benefits of treating uh, adequately the eating disorder rather than kind of letting it languish untreated or um, really deteriorating on an outpatient level would be important. Um, and then as far as finding the right treatment setting, I think, David, you had mentioned um, some of the things that you guys did, asking questions and really um, fit what you were looking for in a treatment center. What would you add to that question? You know, for parents, um, having an understanding of the structure of, of treatment centers. Um, for example, you know, you know, inpatient, you know, residential, partial hospitalization. You, you know, what are they? What do they mean? What is the process that? Uh, you know, a child or adolescent or, you know, would go through in those. And, and then how do each one of those, if you look at the stages or phases, how do each one of those then relate back to a, a progression of, of treatment? Um, because that's first for us, 
when we eventually recalibrated, it, it was really understanding the, the model of eating disorder treatment. And, and once we understood that model, then we were able to understand what treatment center A and treatment center B and treatment center C were saying to us because we, we understood how they operated in their, their world. And then we understood, at that finally understood our son's needs for, for treatment and what he needed to pursue higher level of care to treat his eating disorder. Then we were able to marry that back and really understand what each one of those treatment centers were, were saying to us. Yeah, totally makes sense. Um, this next question, my fiance has an eating disorder and my biggest question is just where to turn for advice on what to do and maybe more importantly what not to do. Um, I'm familiar with an addiction model and am kind of looking for the eating disorder version of Al-Anon if that makes sense. Are you aware of anything like that? Um, some communities do have eating disorder support groups for loved ones, and some of those websites uh, that I mentioned can, might have, a, um, you can search for treatment and you can search for support groups. Some websites also have online forums that can provide that. And so if you're looking kind of for that, support uh, as a person, a loved one, um, or a, a person with a loved one with an eating disorder, I, that would be a good place to start. Um, I think going to, you know, doing the education, but it may be even helpful to find a therapist that knows eating disorders that you can meet with, even if your fiance isn't um, at a point where she can go, um, but is maybe open to you getting more information about it. David, you want to take the next one? Yes, I also um, noticed too on, on different treatment centers websites. There's there's a very or excuse me, there are very welcoming, non evasive, um, like surveys that one could complete and fill out. Um, if they feel they're struggling with the eating disorder and or a loved one of theirs is struggling as well. And th those have, in my experience, have been also very beneficial um, in order to, you know, receive an, an advice or, you know, get yourself pointed in a, in a right direction to get your your answers or answers to your questions. All right, and then David, there's a question about how you knew your son was throwing his lunch away. <laughs> yes, um, when I mentioned that he was throwing away the purchased lunches from the cafeteria, and you know our light bulb went off that hey, we'll we'll just pack a lunch, and he stopped complaining. Well, he was complaining so much in the lunches he was buying, and then all of a sudden we packed lunches, and he stopped complaining. And we, we started to get suspicious, not really knowing why, but we got suspicious. So we um, contacted one of the sixth grade um, school counselors and just said, you know, we'd like some eyes on our son at lunch. Um, you know, he was throwing away his lunches he bought from your cafeteria. Now he's not saying anything, and we want to ensure he's eating it and not throwing it away. And um, the counselor documented for a full week that you know the pack lunch, you know, was you know was tossed after he put the bag in the recycle bin. Got it. Yeah. All right. So our okay. uh, next. Oh, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, Getting those visual eyes on him at school um, was so critical, and and having that, you know, somebody that you could trust that could report back to you something when you you're really not quite sure what it is because at that point we didn't know about eating disorders. Yeah. All right. So our next question. Um, this is so awesome. I am a school counselor and LPC. 
If I refer a student for help, should I first suggest for them to start with a pediatrician or outside therapist? And does ERC need a diagnosis before treating someone who may have a suspected eating disorder? And so um, typically, you're, you start with the lowest level of care, which would be outpatient therapy. And so that would be an, an outpatient, somebody who sees people on a weekly basis um, and on, on an outpatient basis, and it, they could, you could, yes, refer them to their pediatrician as well. Um, we then, usually it's the team that is seeing them outpatient that's making the recommendation for a higher level of care. Um, there are exceptions to this. Sometimes it, it escalates very quickly. They end up um, needing medical hospitalization and then needing um, inpatient or residential treatment stay with us. But typically they start outpatient and rely on the outpatient team to make that recommendation. But we, are, we would be happy to talk to somebody who was wondering about what the next steps would be. Um, our next question asks, what are exchanges? Um, so there are different ways that dietitians use to kind of think about how much of what kinds of foods you're eating. And so exchanges are units of particular food categories. So you might have so many fruit and vegetable exchanges, so many grain exchanges, uh, dairy exchanges, and they, they tailor a meal plan based on exchanges. And obviously there's flexibility within those um, exchanges rather than looking at a specific calorie count. And why? Yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no. It's all yours. No, I, I was just going to say that, you know, exchanges was one of those terms in the world of eating disorders, specifically within the dietitian world, that was very foreign to us when we, you know, started treatment with our son. Um, we very quickly learned for us as parents um, that, we, you know, planning his meals, you know, with parents being educated and meal planning and programming, um, and using the word of exchanges versus the word of calories um, made our return home and, pro and processing of FBT very beneficial because we took the terminology of calories out of our vocabulary. So in our household at family meals, you know, we talk about you know, meeting the exchanges for vegetables, for proteins, for grains. And without using that terminology of calories, we, you know, we reduce the stress, we reduce the anxiety in our son over trying to, one, for example, count the calories or worry about am I getting, you know, too many calories in this particular meal. So exchanges for us as parents gave us a, a, a structure, a format, a for, almost like a formula is how I refer to it, in order to successfully, you know, execute our meal, you know, plans with our son. Yeah. Well said. Uh, the next question asks if it's effective eating disorder treatments use an addiction model. Um, and so uh, addiction model to me implies, if you think of it, the addiction model came out of the treatment of um, alcohol and drug abuse and is often centered around abstinence from substances, which is much harder to achieve, obviously, and not appropriate with food. So um, addiction model, when people are using that in terms of eating disorders, tends to be focused on elimination of particular foods or food groups. Um, which is some people may say is helpful to them, and others may say that is um, very unhelpful for them. As uh, the restricting fuels some of that feeling of um, deprivation that might lead to binging and purging, or it um, really kind of can be a gateway into further restricting. So there could be um, controversy about that, and different different schools of thought about it. Um, all right, our next slide. Uh, at what point do we transition from therapy slash dietitian support 
to intensive outpatient or inpatient treatment. I think I touched on this a little bit, but um, as I would see it, you would have goals. I think it's really important to talk to outpatient providers about what the clear, what are our goals? How do, what are we trying to achieve? Are we looking for X, percent, X amount of weight gain per week? Are we looking for um, a certain reduction in behaviors? And to be able to quantify, is there progress? And then when you are seeing a lack of progress, and there are concerns about, um, and this is when you're consulting with the rest of the team too, so you're also look, talking to the doctor and considering like, what needs to happen to help better, to better help interrupt these behaviors. And so that might be when you would pursue intensive outpatient or inpatient treatment. David, would you add anything to that? Yes, I mean, we were guided um, as you just, you know, highlighted. Um, you know, you know when um, our outpatient team, or in our case, that outpatient team was our local team of the therapist, dietitian, um, and family therapist um, locally in St. Louis, um, and based on our son's um, performance, you know, working with them in that outpatient model and where success and failures were in working on a gene disorder, um, they would guide us and recommend um, whether it be an intensive outpatient or, or also known as an IOP program, or he would require a higher level of care and that being inpatient treatment. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay. Um, this question, there's so much emphasis in the media about clean eating and the benefits of cutting out entire food groups and have you seen an increase in orthorexia? How is it addressed as it seems so acceptable in our society? Uh, that is a, that's a good question. Uh, there is so much um, buzz about clean eating and so for one, Orthorexia is kind of more of a colloquial term and not an actual diagnosis. And so um, I'm guessing what we mean by that is kind of this excessive uh, focus on healthy eating. And somebody may kind of have that presentation and meet criteria for an eating disorder. And so um, it is considered to be very acceptable in our society. And we are, in a lot of ways, when we're fighting eating disorders, we're fighting against the tide of the culture. And so um, we do a lot of education on um, kind of the, one, how our culture puts forth what is, what is acceptable and what is beneficial and challenge some of those ideas. We also want to weigh out the impact of that or um, help somebody see when it's turning into an obsession that's not helpful um, and help them kind of maybe consider that there might be a way to approach food that would be more beneficial. And so um, I think it has to start with somebody wanting to be open to the idea that maybe they could rethink how they're approaching this. And the cutting out of entire food groups we know is so um, hallmark of anorexia that it, it's a really slippery slope to continue to pursue that. Um, our next question, what is the typical duration for intensive outpatient or uh, inpatient treatment? Um, I have less data on IOP, so I will talk about inpatient and residential treatment. And for our adolescent population, our uh, we typically have people for around 45 days, and so um, I would say there's a, a good range on either side of that. Sometimes people are not here that long for a variety of reasons. Maybe they don't need it, maybe their insurance is not supportive, um, or they are here longer because they are in need of it for medical and physical and nutritional stability. Um, so that would be inpatient kind of the inpatient duration of stay. And then RPHP is typically three to four weeks for child and adolescent population. And then IOP, David, do you have any information on IOP? You know, we did do an IOP program um, at our very, you know, first experience with, with treatment locally in St. Louis. You know, 
we were told that their average was anywhere from three to four weeks um, before a determination was made that the child would be successful at home with FBT, with parents and family, or there would be a higher level of care. Um, we really didn't make it that long in IOP because we interrupted, um, you know, our son's treatment with that trip I mentioned. <laughs> so, you know, we weren't the model IOP citizens at that point in time, but that was uh, at least the time frame that was quoted to me. Okay. All right. Um, good questions from the audience. So we have some more. Um, is FBT good for spousal relationships or does this specifically apply to parent-child relationships? And so if we're talking about um, the idea of FBT is parent empowerment, family-based treatment is what we're talking about, parent empowerment to kind of regain control over the eating and the meal plan. Um, the eating disorder comes in and just totally uh, throws all kind of structure out the window and becomes a controlling force in the home. And we want to help parents uh, regain appropriate power in the home. And so in this case, we are talking about parents managing a child's meal plan. They, there is work on young adults with this, but not so much, uh, I'm not aware of any, at least with a spouse with an eating disorder. David, are you aware of anything? No, I, I'm not specific to a spouse. Um, you know, FBT for us was, was truly a family, an umbrella over, over our family, uh, uh, us getting control over our meals, our, our meal planning, and our, our meal execution, um, yeah. you know, from, from, that, from that perspective. So and it, 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 it gave us that, that structure to, to gain that control and I would say execute on that. Um, so it encompasses the whole, the whole family. Yeah. I, I mean, that said, uh, yeah. any family member is a tremendous resource to somebody with an eating disorder. Mm -hmm. And I, I would certainly hope that they're fully involved in the treatment process and part of the therapy process to identify how they can best support their loved one. Um, okay, does exercising and working out need to be monitored by a professional? Um, that's such a tricky thing to navigate for people with eating disorders is often exercise can be a, a part of the symptoms and inappropriate exercise can um, really fuel the disorder. And so um, relying on people to support with what healthy exercise and movement looks like, um, kind of what are the, when does that happen, how does it happen, is it in a social context versus a gym, is it um, happening at what intensity for what frequency, I think is uh, definitely best uh, worked out with the outpatient team. Uh, let's see, we are always hearing that eating disorders are one way the person tries to get some control in their lives. How do we balance our daughter's need to gain some control with the need to make sure she is getting enough nutrition and is working toward recovery? For example, following an eating plan that takes control away from her. Um, this is a great question too. So um, it is tricky with adolescents. They're in this phase of trying to be independent and autonomous, and yet they are still dependent and need things. And so um, they've also got an eating disorder, which they actually don't have the ability to manage effectively. And so that can be kind of a, um, a bone of contention for kids that, you know, everything would be fine if I could control my meal plan. So what we would say is, um, yes, the child needs control in some areas. What are some healthy ways they can start having some control? What, what would that look like? Are there activities that they can identify that they want to be involved in that are apart from eating disorder exercise kinds of things? Um, are there things that they want to work toward having in their lives that they can kind of um, build as an incentive? And so finding ways that they can exercise control apart from food because that has turned into inappropriate control. Mm -hmm. 
Anything else on that one, David? Yeah, and that's and that's a lot wiser what what we did and what we're we're doing again. Um, it's it's shifting his focus of control over his meal plan, over his food, because we have that control, and shifting that over to you know goals for for him to achieve. Um, for example, you know he's working towards um, going over to friend's house. And right now all the friends come over to our house. He's working towards, he's a new driver, so he's working towards returning back um, to driving. He's working towards being able to um, attend this event, this activity after hours at school with the caveat that it doesn't impact the afternoon snack that is part of the regimen, you know, for his, for his meal plan. So it's, it's limits that we set, you know, communicating those as goals to achieve and shifting and directing his control over to focus there away from the control over the food. So for him, he hasn't lost control. He's gaining a lot of control back in important areas of his life. Those are really good concrete examples. Um, all right, next question. Uh, this one is for you, David. As a professional, um, I'm wondering what you thought, David, was the key factor in your son's recovery? What was most effective for him? You know, my son is um, still trying to find his that path for for recovery. So it's it's for him. It's it's work and process. Um, I would say to date, probably the most effective um, method for him has been ACT therapy, um, where he's really able to to see and recognize his life values, prioritize those that are the most important to him, and the ones, of course, that he's lost. And then weigh weigh the the pros and cons of what he lost and what he has, and he he's saying that what he has right now, or or when he's with his illness, that uh, you know that bucket's pretty small, and what he doesn't have is a much larger bucket. So for him, recognizing that using that metaphor, as I think really, really put him in a place to really start consider, to, excuse me, to start to consider that his life is more full without his eating disorder in it. So for him now forward, it's focusing on strengthening, you know, his values attainment, I believe, and, and really working towards, you know, having a very value-rich life. All right, great questions. Um, our next one, are people with eating disorders always anxious or depressed? Can they have a disorder and still be relatively happy? Um, yeah, I think we do know that there is a high comorbidity of anxiety disorders and depressive disorders with eating disorders. Um, but it's not always the case, and there are people that are um, that appear to be somewhat functional. So um, there are people that have eating disorders that don't have a comorbid anxiety or depressive disorder. To answer that question, we also tend to see um, sometimes in people with eating disorders uh, a tendency to mask true emotions, and so it might be that they appear relatively happy or they are. Um, smiling and engaging in life, but there might be stuff underneath that is causing difficulty or kind of driving the behavior. And so that's worth looking at too. Um, Dave, would you add anything to that or observations? You know, I, I've not personally been exposed to, you know, an individual who could have any disorder and be relatively happy. Um, you, you know, my experience has been with my son. Um, I've seen, you know, moments of happiness, but they've they've been short, short-lived. 
and they always seem to be built on a, a false pretense, you know, when he's, you know, really in the, the height of his eating disorder and he's very anxious and, and, or, and or depressed. Um, so, you know, my experience has been there's been some rays of light that come, and, but, but then they, they, they go really quickly. And it's, it's not until, you know, we really have witnessed him in, in previous journeys where he's gotten to a place and, and has been in that good place for a long time that we've seen that, that happiness return. And and, and, yeah. and have that happiness be authentic. Yeah, I would say that it's more often the experience I've had that family members are saying, oh, we're finally seeing glimpses of our child and who who they used to be. And so um, as the, the treatment process, recovery process progresses. And so uh, that's notable, I think, that most of the time we don't see people that are um, Things, things aren't going well when they are coming in for treatment for an eating disorder. Um, our last question it looks like is, what is your approach to someone who has an addiction to exercise as well as, as restrictive eating? Um, and so our approach would be really a reset. And, and so exercise um, takes a back burner, uh, actually removing exercise taking care of the body so that it can heal in the ways that it needs to without the complication of using additional fuel, and then beginning to incorporate exercise in a way that's appropriate and monitored and, and with accountability and support so that it doesn't launch back into that um, addictive kind of quality to it. Yeah, and that's been our, our experience, Liza, our son being an athlete um, and having that addict, addiction as well as exercise and restrictive eating, that um, taking um, exercise and his sport off the table um, and removing that completely to allow him to focus on, on the genius order was, was paramount. And, you know, looking at that as, again, one of those other goals down the road to work to, um, you know, it's something that we set with him, too. All right. Shannon, you want to hear from here? Yeah, um, I just want to thank you all again for being here tonight. I hope that you found this helpful. Um, please stay logged in so you can complete the survey at the end. Like I said, for you professionals, you'll need to do this to receive your CE credits. And for everyone else, it's just a great way for us to better our educational programs for you. So again, thank you so much. And feel free to email me if you have any additional questions. Take care. Bye-bye.